What's up, ladies and gentlemen? Welcome back. This is The Deep Corner, presented by the Volleyball League of America, episode 36. I'm Rob St. Clair, and a very special guest today, all the way from Luxembourg in the middle of Europe. Um, we have Mr. Dan Mentally. He runs 5-1-VB. Follow him at 5-1-VB on Instagram. Uh, the 5-1 Volleyball Podcast coming out every week. It's by far the best way to follow uh, pro overseas volleyball if you speak English. So give that a check out. And he also, as of recently, is the digital content coordinator for the CEV, the whole governing body of the sport in all of Europe, which is pretty cool. We've got a lot to talk about. Dan and I go way back. I've been on this podcast a couple times. Dan, welcome to the show. Rob, thanks for having me. Also a big fan of the Deep Corner, so it goes both ways. Thank you, man. Uh, so for anyone here who doesn't listen to your show, uh, they should, because like I said, it's the easiest way by far, in my opinion, to keep up with what's going on in the in the European leagues and wherever else. Any big news in the volleyball world, you are one of the first people to talk about it on your show. So in case anyone doesn't watch it, could you give us like one quick headline from maybe each of the big three European leagues right about now in early December. Yeah. So like Rob said, the podcast comes out once a week, go over the biggest news, recap some, a few games that I watched throughout the week. And yeah, just to give a, a few headlines. So in Italy right now, usually a four, a four man race, right? Trentino, Modena, Lube Perugia, been yep. the big players for the last few years. But right now, Lube Perugia kind of like pulling ahead here. Modena lost like, an entire Olympic gold medal team worth of players between Zaitsev and Bednorz and um, all, all their other guys. Yeah, they really, they really only have a setter and a libero. Anderson, like, <laughs> yeah, which, I mean, they have a great setter and libero. Yes. But, and Trentino, like, just weird stuff is happening in Trentino because they, you know, they spent tons of money, like millions and millions of euros, buying, like, some of the best players in the world. And they're in eighth place. Ouch. <laughs> like, four and seven or four and eight or something, so... Not not good for them. Although Simone Gianelli back tonight apparently. Yes, they tonight. uh they had um they were hit maybe the hardest by coronavirus. They had a, a decent size outbreak that killed like or that didn't kill but like knocked off the wrong players at the wrong times. They just had to play like a whole Champions League weekend without their setter. They put Nimir Abdelaziz back to setter. That's my Champions League headline. Yeah, <laughs> that was crazy to watch. So uh, yeah, Italy's wild. Uh, who's your like surprise team in Italy right now? Definitely Viva Valencia. And for all the American listeners of this podcast, TJ DeFalco. Yep. Big member of the starting lineup of that team, really developing nicely. I think uh, I think American fans who don't really follow or watch pro European volleyball will be like pleasantly surprised when they see him back with Team USA. Maybe not challenging Sander Russell for a starting spot, but he'll be in the mix in Tokyo for sure, I think. Yeah, I'm really excited about that because that – like you and I have talked about a little bit, who's going to be that third and fourth outside on the U.S. Olympic roster, and uh, that there's really no sure answer right now. So if TJ has a really good year, he's got a much better chance to get his foot in the door on that one. So that was really cool. Yeah, and yeah the cool. Thibaut Rossard, Chin and Yeezy, um, the couple of French guys uh, on that Viable Valencia team, Enrico Chester, they're, they're, they're legit, and they beat some good teams, and it's been fun to watch them. They really came out of nowhere. Yeah, they, I mean, they've had a, a couple of losses now to Perugia um so I mean I, I don't think they're gonna they're a title contender or anything but it's, it's fun yeah it's it's fun, it's fun. <laughs> every, everyone knows like that equivalent team in several sports it's just fun to watch you're probably not gonna win it but exactly how about Poland what's going on in Poland these days I mean Poland's probably the league that has been the hardest hit by coronavirus I mean it, <laughs> for like a month or two there it looked like getting like one game a week maybe yeah so many teams are taken out but uh Zaksa Kajushin Kozil still absolutely killing it undefeated Ben Taniuti absolutely orchestrating that team dishing the ball out to everyone the general man Equally. he's so good yeah he's really good David Smith for um, American fans David Smith yeah and then also for American fans we still haven't seen Taylor Sander so no, that's a big headline but, like month 18, 19 of, of no Taylor Sander, it feels like at this point. Yeah, that's a very serious concern. Uh, and, th there's... and we're creeping closer to Olympics here, guys. Like... Yeah, man, shoulders are so weird. It um, it sounds like he's at least back practicing with Scrab Elkatov again. Yeah, I've heard, he's definitely been practicing on the court, but it's almost more scary that he's been practicing for a month now. And, and still, not playing. Still not playing. I mean, maybe it's a good thing that, because he clearly wouldn't have been able to play. Um, if Tokyo 2020 happened, it's original time slot. So very good point. Yeah, there's there's no way he could have seen the floor. Yeah. 
Um, so that's been one then, to follow. And then Russia, we were just talking about before, like mm-hmm. this is like the year to get into the Russian league because A, the league's really good. It goes like seven yeah. teams deep. Like it's legit really, teams. really good. And there's some names, yeah. like they only have two foreigners per roster, but there are some big names on the top five, six, seven teams that everyone's going to know. Exactly. I mean, and even like Russia, there's so much, they have such good infrastructure. Like the domestic talent is really high. I mean, not enough to fill all 12 teams. Like the bottom three teams are still pretty brutal, but it's still like a lot of really good players. Like you said, two foreigners would have been, would be real nice if Russia could get three foreigners. Oh. Like, can you imagine like what Zenit Kazan could be if they, <laughs> if they, if they had another foreigner? Um, but I would say the biggest storyline for them right now is Dynamo Moscow, also undefeated. So, uh, you know, a team that I thought I, I'm, I'm pissed they didn't make the Champions League because they lost to Trentino in the qualifying round and they would have been really fun to watch. But, you know, Laurie Kerman in the Finnish libero, Sam Daru. And I really like their setter I was talking about on my last podcast, Pavel Pankov, as the team hitting like his outside hitters hitting like 60 plus percent. Wow. Spit on Sokolov on that team, right? Yeah, Sven and Sokolov as well. Finally finding like a home in Russia where we can belong at the opposite and not have any weird pin situation yeah. like in Kazan last year. Yeah, yeah. Kazan, Kazan that experiment is over. Right. Uh, Bartosz <laughs> Bednors. Yeah, they did. Bartosz Bednors having a really good year so far in Kazan for any Polish fans out there. Yeah, leading the league in aces. And so I guess like the year in Modena last year wasn't a wasn't a, a fluke. Right. Like he's keeping uh, which is important for... I mean, but he still probably won't play at the Olympics. I mean, we'll yeah, see. which like, is outrageous, man. Poland insane. with all those pins. So uh, you make a good point about this is the year to get into the Russian league. That's mm-hmm. because it's more accessible than it's ever been. Pretty much all the games are on their YouTube channel for free, and they look mm-hmm. really, really nice. They're doing a really good job broadcasting this year, and they've put them out like to the general worldwide public in a way that they never have before. What's going on with that? Is that like a worldwide trend that we're seeing? I think a lot of clubs see an opportunity here. I mean, A, it's partly because there's no fans in the arena, so yeah. they want to distribute it as much as possible um, on streaming platforms. I think, I mean, I think people just want to get more eyes on their volleyball games. You know, keeping the games behind a paywall is okay for some games and it's okay for in some situations, but there's always a trade-off in terms of building future fan bases, uh, building new fans, getting new fans and, you know, building your product as a more like internationally competitive product. And, you know, yeah, it's always a trade off because if, if you can make money, you can charge your five, $10, whatever per month for your, for your platform, but you're not going to reach as many people. So right. I think, I think volleyball in general is still more in a growth phase than in a, you know, time Profit. to lock down and monetize mm-hmm. all our content phase yeah and we'll get into that a lot more later because you've been yeah. more involved in that directly than ever before um we talked about champions league really quick but uh where you know more about this because you work at the cev um so you said that early right before we started recording this that first of all the competition is still going on which is great news uh because a, a lot great. yeah great news a lot could have gone wrong obviously with pandemic but the format has changed just a little bit uh, the competition is still happening. Uh, what stage are we at right now? Uh, when is the next round? Who are the contenders, in your opinion? Give us a little bit of Champions League. So basically, instead of um, each team playing a, a home and away against each other in their pool, we're basically, it's the same amount of games we're having. It's basically just one big round and then the second big round. So think of it as two big rounds, two tournaments that each um, club is competing in. So they basically play a four-person round robin you know, in the first tournament and then the second tournament, that's it. Which is actually, I think, I think it's a great format for the fans. Honestly, I wouldn't mind. Uh, I mean, it's it's not as good for the clubs because they don't get that home game. Yeah, they can you know sell for fans, so it probably won't happen. But I think it's been really fun to watch as a fan. Like you can really get invested in one tournament and like follow a, a few teams really intensely at once, and then back off. Okay, <laughs> don't need to worry about those teams for a little bit. But uh, in terms of contenders um, in Champions League. I mean, I did a power rankings for the CV, which you can check out. Um, I think I had Zenek is on the top of the list. I think, uh, you know, they've been completely dominant the last decade, like one of the most yeah. dominant runs in, in all of sports. Yeah, really. Uh, it's, for the last decade. You can't like, possibly this, overstate how good they have been for the last 10 years. And win, winning Champions League is not easy. It's a lot of games right. on top of an already intense uh, domestic schedule. 
Yes, and this is this team. This isn't some weird team with Maxim Mikhailov at outside hitter. This is like Irvin Engapet, Ben Norris, two of the best outside hitters in the world. Mikhailov back at opposite. You know. Alexander Buchko, who I love. And yeah, two yeah. big Russian middles. Artem like, Volvich in yeah. the middle, yeah. Yeah, they're, so, they're built for it. You can't count out uh, Lube Perugia. And I'm going to be honest, before the season started, I thought Trentino was definitely a Champions League threat as well. Maybe, maybe the way they've been playing so far. Uh, not quite as confident in that. But, uh, <laughs> well, they survived. Like, like we said, they survived without their starting setter for a weekend, uh, which is pretty impressive. But yeah, I would definitely say it's a three-way race between Zenica Zahn, uh, Lube, and Perugia. And then on the women's side, I would say Canaliano, Vakif Bank. That's like the finals. Everyone's already decided it. <laughs> like Those are the two best teams, which if you watch them, it seems, it seems to be the case. Mm-hmm. When is the next round of Champions League on the men's side? When is like the next little weekend? So tournament? We actually have five tournaments next week. Wow. Yeah. So one's taking place in Poland, Kajerz and Kozil. Um, one is taking place ooh, in Berlin. And one's taking place in Tours in France. So. Okay. So those are the three men's tournaments. And I'm not... Sure, off the top of my head where the women's tournaments are, but we have five. So it's going to be, I'm going to be really busy next You're week. You're going to be very busy next week. <laughs> uh, starting tomorrow, probably. But. Well, let's talk about what that exactly means for you now. So you are fully employed doing volleyball full time for the CEV, like the governing body of the most volleyball rich area in the world. And you're just like a kid from Canada that loves volleyball. How? How did that, how are you where you are at now? It's just, it's just such a, cool story the, the fact yeah, that you're doing yeah so the real. first uh the first non-european that the cv has ever hired which is is that true <laughs> that's amazing yeah. which is funny i'm uh, trying to work out the visa process and everything yeah if anyone's ever uh moved from from north america to, to europe it's it's not a straightforward process let's say <laughs> um so basically you know i started 5-1 volleyball i saw there was a big gap in the market there wasn't there was a couple people you know kind of talking about volleyball but for me, as a huge NBA fan and a huge sports fan in general, you know, there's a certain way, a certain way that we're accustomed to media following sports in North America, using a lot of stats, using a lot of analysis, you know, really thinking about the sport and diving into the sport like headfirst and just like analyzing everything. And I saw that was like absolutely non-existent in volleyball. So I decided to start this blog, YouTube channel, and then the podcast a little bit later. And then I started writing for, I don't know if any listeners remember Volley Mob, which is yeah. a... Uh, yeah, I do. Yeah. So I think uh, the Volley Mob, someone from Volley Mob contacted me based on a Reddit post, I think. <laughs> so I started writing for them. And then I saw an advert for uh, externals, like uh, media people for the CV. And I applied to that. Use the Volley Mob as a point on my resume. Use my 5-1 volleyball stuff on my point on my resume. And, was hired as an external from Canada, which was easy easier at that point because of the time difference. So I could easily work, you know, the 8.30 start games because for them, it's, or for me now, it's working till midnight or 1 a.m. <laughs> when you're in Canada, it's like, you know, by dinner time, you're done. Right. So that was great. And then they had a opening a couple of years later at the CV head office, applied and got the job. So and now here I am. Here you are. So your title is digital content coordinator. And mm-hmm. so now you have all of all of that experience trying to break into a, a part of the sports market in North America, like you were talking about, that didn't really exist for volleyball. And now you have much more resources at your disposal in a region that consumes volleyball a lot differently. So mm-hmm. knowing what you know now, like now that you're you're doing it for real day to day, um, getting paid to be a volleyball media guy. What is different? Well, what would you say is different at least in 2020 versus maybe when you started um, starting to cover volleyball on the internet? Has has there been a bunch that's changed even in the last like five years or so? Yeah, I, I would say so. I mean, it looks like there's a ton more, you know, I would call it smart volleyball content being created whether it be like yourself, whether it be, you know, out of system with the, the Warsley yeah. brothers, um, you know, there's volleyball explained, uh, which I really like if you guys, um, haven't heard, heard about that. It's a good channel. I mean, I, yeah, exactly. There's, there's, I feel like there's a lot more people, Oh, like realizing, okay, this is possible. Um, and I've also seen it even on the institutional side from the FFEB, 
and from the CV and from uh, some of the national federations that they're using Instagram more. They're on social media. Like you see a couple of the Italian volleyball clubs have like over a hundred thousand followers on TikTok. Whereas like, I think when, when I started five on volleyball, like nobody even posted highlights on Instagram. Like I was the only person like posting volleyball highlights Which on Instagram. Which is unthinkable now. Yeah, it's, that's, that's three years ago. And, and in the three years since then, like, you know, there's tons of people doing it. So um, I think, you know, I think we're on a start of a bit of a wave here, hopefully in terms of volleyball media. Cause even, yeah, even since I've entered the game, so to speak, it, there's been a lot of improvement in my opinion. Yeah, and you alone, 5-1 Volleyball, you have 10,000 followers. And like Everett from Volleyball Source, another Canadian guy who is about to come on the show, uh, also like five-digit number of followers. Like there is a market for that, and you guys have proved it. And now the governing bodies and the teams are starting to catch up and realize the type of content that get people's attention the most. So in the process of figuring that out, what, in your opinion, or like in your experience at the CV? What are your priorities for the content that you're making? Video, uh, stats, podcasts, what uh, what are you guys focusing on? So, I mean, the CV, it's a little different from being like an independent content creator. Like you have a few different stakeholders yeah. that you're beholden to. It's not just, okay, let's put content out there and whatever gets the most engagement possible, that's the only thing we're worried about. You also have to like think about how to support clubs because we also provide a lot of content and, and stuff for them. You also have to think about, you know, how can we produce content that's within our rights and, you know, do it on, on a budget as well. Also important things to consider, but I think it's just, you know, mainly showing like how amazing the sport of volleyball is and getting more people watching the games, creating storylines around our competitions and yeah, just showing the speed and, and the power and, you know, getting people to more get associate like with the players a little bit more because, I think there's there's a few volleyball players that have legitimate crossover star potential. That's eventually, maybe not maybe not right now, but there's some good personalities in there. Totally, yeah, that's a, a thing athletic that talents. yeah, I think that we're so used to in North American sports is the is like we know the players personally so well in really all four of the major sports. We just have such a look into their personalities that in volleyball we really just really don't have. And you're right. There's a ton of potential for that, and I think people want to see that. It's just like, yeah, how, well, do, how do we get look it? Look at him? Eric Shoji started yeah. his YouTube channel what, like two months ago, yeah. and now he has like however many like triple my subscribers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, funny what <laughs> what job. what you can do when you're like the second best libero on the planet, just like making mm -hmm. random little reaction videos. They're so they're so simple, but it's people yeah. people want that content. Like that proves it right there. Mm -hmm, for sure. So when it comes to broadcasting matches, like mm -hmm. for whatever league, even if it's like CV Champions League, um, producing a live broadcast, what are the CV's priorities with that? Because there's a lot of details about a live broadcast that make it good or terrible or really, really fun to watch. There are a lot of little details that go into that. So what for you guys are the biggest things that you think about in a live broadcast? Well, I mean, so the way our kind of events work is we have two categories. We have just our regular events, and then we have top events, which are Champions League Super Finals, Euro Volley, and Euro Beach Volley. Okay. So those those three events get way more way more uh, cameras, way more production value, and that's where we put a, a lot of the production budget. For the rest of the games, it's a lot of time a matter of who's producing it, um, kind of the host who's producing what they're capable of. And to be honest, the priority is just making sure, you know, the stream is stable, available. And yeah. So I would say that the biggest sliding scale we use in terms of how we upgrade our quality is the number of cameras. Mm -hmm. So like we'll have a minimum four cameras for our lowest events and then all the way up to eight, nine, 10 cameras for, for the bigger events. Um, I mean, yeah, I think there's a couple things, a couple other ways we could upgrade it. <laughs> And, but I'll, well, maybe we'll talk about that not a bit later. Mm -hmm. So how about th this? Now, this is a weird one because you're in Europe that you're you govern over the entire European continent, which is so volleyball rich, speaks a million different languages. How do you ha approach having commentators for your games in the CV? What language oh. are you prioritizing? Uh, th this is a weird one. Like and how 
if you pick like, I don't know, an English speaking commentator, are you expecting to lose people's interest? Are you picking Italian commentators for Italian league games? I don't know anything about how this works. How does this work for assigning a broadcaster to do a CV game? So it's actually not really us who decides that. Okay. Um, it's more the rights holders. Like if a uh, Russian TV buys our Russian league matches, then they can have their own commentators. If when Polestat buys our Polish league matches, they have their own commentary team. So it really comes down to um, the broadcaster rather than us. And even, even then, it's if our media rights partner would assign the would assign the broadcast or assign the commentator. Not like it's almost never us. Okay. Yeah, but I would say, unfortunately, for our competitions, um, we don't have. The only, I think the only market where we haven't sold the rights is the UK in terms of English speaking markets. So to have to pay for an English commentator when that's the only market we really would be serving is, is doesn't no, make no point. Hey, well, if you need a volunteer who can sit in Chicago and do it remotely, you, uh, you know who <laughs> to call. <laughs> um, so this doesn't really apply during the pandemic, obviously, because there almost nowhere in the world are there fans at games but let's let's fast forward to whenever the world's back to normal what does the CEV do in particular if anything to work on putting butts in seats at games um, do you have any influence over trying to market to get fans sitting in the arenas at games or is that more on the clubs or the leagues it's mostly on the clubs leagues whoever's hosting so if a, a tournament's happening in, in Germany then a lot of times the German National Federation, Volleyball Federation would do a lot of the work, mm -hmm. but we do support them. It's not, my, my role is more supporting online. Yeah. So doing like, you know, paid marketing campaigns uh, on social media or doing an organic, you know, reach with our kind of content as well, content creation that we hope will reach fans, sell tickets. But yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's a lot of advertising, you know, banners, traditional, you know, radio advertisements, um, that kind of thing, TV commercials. Nothing, uh, nothing probably you haven't heard of before. <laughs> yeah, man, I just the dream of even having that in North America for volleyball right. is just insane. <laughs> um, so you've loved volleyball forever. What can you just give your stamp on or your take on what it is like to watch volleyball in person? And because I've talked about this a million times with people on this show before. How much of a, does a, of a difference does it make to you to see the speed of the game, the size of the players, the athleticism in real life up close? Like how much more fun is it than even watching a good quality stream online? Oh, it's, it's, you can't even compare it. And I mean, I, th I do think there's ways we can improve the way we broadcast the sport to make it a little closer to how it feels in person. But even then, like it's, it's, I think it's one of the big, I would say basketball, is a lot like this too, where it's just a completely different sport in person. Totally. But just just the speed of the game is you in the power. I remember sitting at Euro Volley watching, I think the German and Dutch national teams do hitting lines. And when you're watching on TV, you know, it looks pretty cool, but when you're at in the arena, you realize how crazy hard they're hitting the ball, even in hitting lines. Like where the press row is, is at the end of the back of the court. And after they bounce it and you catch the ball, like you can barely catch it. Like it's still, even after a bounce, it still has an insane amount of uh, potential energy. <laughs> and yeah, and, I, and I've been lucky enough to see like, even I've, I've only been to a couple of competitions, but to see like the beach volleyball Vikings play like Those right up close. Those are crazy. I've seen, you know, the Polish national team play up close. I've seen Irvin Engapet. I was on the court for the Euro volley finals and semifinals. So yeah, I've, I've had some cool experiences and like it's a completely different game in person. Yeah, even, I've had the same even just as a fan without like media credentials or whatever. But the, the U.S. men's national team likes to play VNL in or around Chicagoland a lot when yeah. those tournaments well, we are happening. we were both at the yeah, yeah, last, yeah, we yeah, you and I were both at VNL finals when it was here in Chicago, like I guess now two summers ago, a year and a half ago. Uh, that, man, especially when the guys are like peaking at the finals of that tournament, seeing that in real life is just it blows your mind, even as a as a, someone who loves volleyball and watches all the time. That was like a, a live viewing experience like I've never even had before because the teams were playing at a level that I hadn't seen in real life before. And even that made a difference for me. It is crazy how good those guys are, how big they are, how fast they are, how fast everything moves. And like, it, it's it's impossible to get a feel for like how tall Matt Anderson is in real life. 
and, and, unless yeah. you're like sitting in the first five rows and you see him walk by like 15 feet away from you and how he's like effortlessly putting his forehead at the top of the antenna like it's absurd seeing it in real life it's so much fun it's what it's what i wish everybody knew how cool it was yeah and even like i've, I've been lucky enough to watch a lot of uh like college volleyball as well and like the high level pros is completely different level oh yeah it's completely it's like watching yeah high school versus college it's maybe an even bigger jump to college versus pro so uh, yeah again like you said there's what there's one opportunity maybe so right now i guess with vnl to watch that kind of volleyball in north america well hopefully we're the the league yeah. the league i'm working for is yeah. trying to put out more more chances exactly. we're gonna put it in front of kids when they're already at a junior event playing and it's just right next to them they don't even have to go anywhere and they're gonna see it so that is a huge part of our plan. So I want to talk plenty about that. First, uh, I want to take a little break to have a funny, like, hypothetical question. If sure. you had, if, if you could pick, let's say you have an infinite budget, you could pick the best seven volleyball players in the world right now to make a starting seven of each, like, standard position, who would it be for you? Any country, any player. Alfredo Leon, Irvin Enkapet, Sreko Lizanach, Robert Landy Simon, Jenny Grabenikov. And, and I forgot the opposite. Opposite. Uh, Namir Abdelaziz. Ooh, okay. So uh, yeah. I've, ta- I've talked about this a lot of my podcasts recently. Number one opposite right now, in my opinion, Namir. That is crazy. So who is that guy for people who don't know who he is and about a little bit about his story? So yeah, Dutch volleyball player, played a lot of setter. Growing up at a pretty high level too. Yeah. You know, play, played for the Dutch national team and uh, a couple French clubs. And was he setter or opposite when he played on Zaxa? Do you remember? He was a setter. He was a setter. Yeah. So, like, playing a setter on the highest level and then decided to switch to opposite um, and then was like leading the league, Italian league in scoring every year as an opposite. And now got a huge payday with Trentino. And is He's not that old either. Play. He, he's like what twenty nine or thirty? I, yeah, I just, no, he's still got he's still got years left. I just sure. felt like I had been hearing his name forever because I just remember him as being that one Dutch setter who jumps really high. Uh, yeah, yeah, and yeah, now he's like, he jumps really high. Maybe he should play opposite. Maybe he should play opposite. <laughs> yeah, sure enough. Um, yeah, the dude has a crazy arm. Um, he's you know the stat lines better than I do, but he's he's up towards the top of Italy in hitting percentage, total points, aces, uh, the whole nine yards. He's having a heck of a year. Uh, well, Fred Leon, like you said, is a no-brainer. Um, is he the best player in the world, in your opinion? Oh yeah, easily. Yeah, I I don't think anyone is going to argue and, that. You know, I think his uh, I think he's like developed a lot recently. I've been watching a lot of Perugia games this year. He has his, his float serve passing has improved a lot. His platform passing, also his uh, he's got like his tip game was super awkward when Vital Hainan tried to force him to do it like two years ago. Like it was a joke how bad he was at tipping because he never needed to. No, why would he? Now, now, he, now he's got a little bit of finesse, like a little bit of finesse, which I like. That's terrifying. Well, now in Perugia, he kind of, he, even more so than previous years, he's taken most of the high pressure swings for that team. Yeah, well, I mean, they had Luciano Dicheco in the past to basically any ball he could set to anywhere. Right. Whereas now Dragon Trevigo a little more limited, so has to go to the outlets a bit more, which is a lot of the time uh, is going to be Wilfredo Leon. Not a bad outlet to have. Uh, your second outside hitter choice is really interesting. You picked Irvin Ingepet. I think there's a lot of ways that you could choose to pick that L2 spot because, like, Irvin Ingepet is – sorry, uh, Wilfredo Leon's a no-brainer. Um, but there's a lot of styles of outside hitter that exist in the world. And yeah. uh, the complementary aspect and, like, what you bring to a starting seven has a lot to do with – how you would pick that spot. So explain your Irvin Ingepet choice because I think it's a good one. So I actually like him because I think he fits really well next to Wilfredo Leon. I think Irvin Ingepet is like the, I think a lot of people see him as like the ultimate star offensive option, like going to score six points per set. No. no, he's like, he's just like the best at everything else. Like he's an yeah. incredible jump server. He has beautiful second hands. He's an incredible he uh, passer, easily the best uh, defender. Uh, in position six. Definitely the best middle back defender in the world, for yeah, yeah, sure. Exactly. It's such an underrated part of this game. And, I mean, he's, he's a great attacker. He's a flashy attacker. He, he has a lot of tools at his disposal. But he's not, like, he's not hitting at 12 feet every time. Like, he's he does get limited uh, attacking sometimes. But I know. I think he's the perfect complement next to Wilfredo Leon. I think you need someone like that who can do all the little things that maybe Leon could just leave him to, to hit and serve. Yeah. And uh, Ingepet will 
Yeah, that's that's a really good pick. Uh, your setter libero happened to be that Modena duo that we talked yeah. about. My, Micah Christensen from the U.S., Jenny Grubenikoff from France. Uh, Grubenikoff is obviously a no-brainer. A setter is a much more interesting discussion that we could have for hours and hours if we wanted to. Um, that is a good choice. What is going on with them in Modena right now? It's kind of proof that a setter and a libero I mean, can't make a team. Yeah, I mean, but, but we already knew that. Like, yeah, I, already knew that. <laughs> I don't think anyone's saying like uh, a, a really top tier setter is going to carry. Can, 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 they can't carry anyone. No, it's impossible. That's why it's. I mean, the setter position is the most important, but also, yeah, it, having your best players in opposite or outside hitters is probably better for uh, a floor raising team, I guess. It's what it's. I think that's what's cool about the sport of volleyball is you can't carry a team with well in almost any case you can't carry a team on the back of one player uh even wilfredo leon couldn't quite carry some teams uh without a little bit of support it's an interesting thought experiment what's the worst team that wilfredo leon could be on and still <laughs> make like the italian league playoffs yeah that might be a whole uh, podcast episode in and of itself uh your middle choices fresco lisa notch robert landy simone are really good choices um there's... Middle two, there's a lot of ways you could go. Yeah, now, I think Robert Landy Simon. I mean, I think he's he's having one of the best years of his career. He's so good this year. Him and DeCecco together are unfair. It's an absolute cheat back code. together. The band is back Finally, together. Back from the uh, Piacenza days. Yeah, those two are great. I just, ser- I mean, I just watched him serve like six aces. Yeah. in a row. Yeah, that match like, the other night. You go with the dagger. Oh man, yeah, he's, he's dangerous. But you could also go like Lucas Satcamp. Could go Mazursky. Mm-hmm. Both both of them a little bit past their primes. I think the two that you chose yeah. are are good choices. Mm-hmm. All right, uh, let's let's move on to some more like volley media stuff. So we talked a little bit about the segment that you wedged yourself in in North America. The North American sports market is insane. It's so dense. There's so much there. There's the, the big four professional sports that dominate the U.S. and Three of those MLS gaining ground every year. MLS is gaining ground every year. Uh, yeah, people want soccer more and more and more. Three, golf, tennis. I'm a I'm a big golf fan for sure. Uh, people want three of those big four have Canadian teams. Uh, hockey, obviously, a tremendously big deal in Canada. Um, is there even a market for volleyball in North America? I guess that's the first place to start. Like, is there even a point in a league like the VLA trying to do what it's doing? Like, do people even want to see professional volleyball? Yeah, it's. I mean, it's a question we've been asking ourselves. Every volleyball media person asks themselves all the time, yeah. like every day. And I mean, personally, I think for sure there is. I mean, I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing, I don't think, if, if I didn't think there was a market potential. I mean, volleyball is like a big business. Do you know how many club fees are spent on volleyball every year? Do you know how many scholarships are given out? Do you know how many Adidas and Mizuno shoes are bought every year? Do you know how many gym space is rented out every year? There's a lot of people playing volleyball and a lot of people spending money in volleyball. But yeah, like it's it hasn't translated to any type of serious, really professional league yet, or a lot of eyeballs. Even except for the Olympics, Americans don't really watch volleyball. Yeah, the if you don't have maybe some NCAA women's, but yeah, that that actually is pretty big every December yeah. or whatever. Um, yeah, if you don't like grow up playing the game, if you don't have a kid who plays the game, whatever. If you're not a seasoned volleyball person, you're volleyball is never like put in front of you and you're never going to go out of your way to watch it because just nobody knows and i think that's the the biggest task that we have in volleyball media is to put it in front of people and for people to figure out why it's so cool because it is and we know that it is um and i think there's been a, i mean i don't i don't know if this is a good time to talk about it but i think there's been some like really good developments on that end recently with how like crazy popular is volleyball is on instagram and tiktok like it's unbelievable, like the amount of people that are into volleyball, uh, especially like Gen Z, are yeah. all about volleyball. Like, yeah, we can talk. We don't have to talk about this a bit, a lot, but like High Q has been like maybe the biggest volleyball crossover thing since Top Gun. Like, <laughs> dude, that's an that's an interesting one, and I, I go back and forth on that a lot because I get annoyed by the comments section on every single volleyball related YouTube video just being yeah. exclusively like High Q references. Oh, I am. I am pro high Q to the. I haven't even. I haven't watched it. Me neither. But, but it's but, brought. Uh, it has brought so yeah. many eyes to the sport of volleyball, the, the real life sport of volleyball that wouldn't have otherwise been there. And that you, that is never ever a bad thing. You can never argue against that. No. Any type. Any time volleyball is in popular media, even if it's anime, which is nothing wrong with that. I think it's like 
amazing for the sport. And I, I really hope that it's not just a flash in the pan. And like these people that are, you know, posting these stupid YouTube comments, you know, five years down the line, they're competing in rec tournaments and buying subscriptions to Eurovolley TV. Right? Yeah, like, or they're, they're like following Trentino or Modena or yeah, their exactly. national team or whatever. Yeah, that is, that's what we want. They, that's, that's breaking into a, a viewership segment that wouldn't have otherwise been there for the game of volleyball, which is a huge deal. So in North America in particular, um, you and I both have a, a little bit of experience with this by now. How? How do we break into that market? How do we get volleyball in front of people who already have so many sports to consume all around them that have a lot more money and a lot more content and a lot more you know, infrastructure than we do? How do we put volleyball in front of people in North America? Well, I think, like you said, yeah, it's it's getting people to watch games in person and seeing you know how crazy fun the game is and how fast it is at the highest level, which you can do by getting them in an arena like the VLA is doing and going to youth events and things like that, or you know shooting a sixty frames per second TikTok video of uh, Lou Bechivtanova hitting lines, right? Like it's both kind of the same thing. It's showing the power, speed, and size of the sport. So. And I think I think it, we have to be patient too. I think yeah. that's a, a huge part of it because you see, I mean, I don't want to tear down other sports, but there is declining participation levels in some big North American sports, like football, for example. Oh, right? big time! Yeah, the big youth, time declining, and I think we're going to see the same thing across other sports. Is you know, player safety and concussions, and that becomes an even even bigger deal as parents take because volleyball. You know, unless dodgeball becomes super popular, it's the only real team non-contact sport, right? Yeah, it, unless you really want to count baseball, which is hardly a yeah, team, a bit, yeah. hardly a team sport to be honest. It's just, it's just so different. Um, but yeah, you talked already a little bit about the youth numbers for volleyball in North America. Um, I wish I had like number figures in front of me. The number of juniors, especially girls in the U.S. that are playing volleyball is an all-time high and numbers that are just insane. And that right there is already proof of demand of the sport of volleyball. People are buying, yeah, knee pads and shoes and volleyballs and gym space and paying club fees and traveling on weekends when the pandemic is over to play and, you know, qualifiers and go to nationals and all that stuff. There's so many people that are playing. And then in like in women's NCAA, there's like four divisions and then the NAIA and all of you sports in Canada, there's thousands and thousands of college volleyball players there too. So it's weird that it's never translated to the professional level, but it's not like there aren't volleyball like thirsty yeah, eyeballs. Exactly, right. <laughs> like there, there are people there that like volleyball that if you put it in front of them, they will consume it. It's it's uh, no, for me, for me, I, I do, I do truly believe it's just a matter of time yeah. before like, I think I think it's going to be a really uphill battle until you hit the threshold where top American and Canadian players are staying in North America to play. That will be a, a huge deal somewhere down the road. It will take a, a long a long time yeah, to get exactly. to that point. It's, but it's, it's a really really uphill climb to get to that point because you know there's, there's a huge advantage for Europe right now in terms of how organized it is, how much they we're paying players, you know, how much exposure they get in the competitiveness, but. You know, I think I think it is a goal, a realistic goal. Definitely a goal. It's definitely a goal of ours, the VLA. And once you get one or two big name players to actually stay home and make it their career, everyone else is going to follow. It's it's why yeah, all exactly. the all the other leagues in the U.S. have been the best in the world in their respective sports for so long. Is everybody in the world at the top of their games wants to come to the U.S. to play sports if the money is right and. If you get the talent, the money will become right pretty quickly. It's yeah. a kind and, of a problem that solves itself once you get the people, once you like fight the uphill battle, you know? And I mean, we, we can see the end game because Poland right now is the end game. Like yep. volleyball is like insane in Poland. Like it's on primetime TV all the time. Random people on the street know all the players. Like every like everyone has their favorite team. There's Polish gear everywhere of the clubs. So like that's the end game. They have big TV deals. They have top production on every single matches even on the bad teams they have pro real professional like commentators in suits doing halftime shows and they have the whole deal like we can already see a real world example of what it looks like yep it's there it's by far the biggest sport in poland it's bigger than soccer it's bigger than anything else the way that their fans consume volleyball is incredible to me all i want to do in my life once is go to like a 
a Zaxa yeah. or a Scra home I, game. No, and, I, I need, I need, I need to go there. Yeah, with like sixty thousand people yep. sitting in there, like going insane, knowing everything that's going on. It's, it's amazing. I've been to a, I've been to a handful of Polish games in the U.S. where I, as an American fan, am outnumbered yeah. fifty to one because sure. it's insane. Everyone in Poland just craves volleyball. They love it. They've figured it out. They figured out how cool it is. They they worship their national team players. It's amazing the culture of volleyball that they built there. You're right. It's been done. It exists in the world. There's nothing inherently wrong with volleyball that it can't <laughs> no. happen in other places. Yeah, it's it's obviously happened. They just I don't know. They they broke into the market that was there and everybody got on board. Yeah, and I mean big big success at the national team level, which is what I think spread a lot of the growth in Italy in the 90s and some of the development in the Netherlands, but it's, I mean, yeah, it's, it's, it's tough to break into a market that doesn't have like has as much saturation as the U S yeah, said. Like, that's crazy. true. There's, people only have so much time in their lives for, <laughs> to consume, for to be a sports fan. Yeah. So, uh, we talked a little bit about the CEVs strategy for digital content and production and all the stuff that's going on right now, especially in a pandemic year. But let's say you were in charge of, the VLA's digital content. Let's say you were in charge mm -hmm. of um, promoting a North American professional league. Um, how would you approach that similarly and differently to the way the CEV is doing it, just because it's in North America? Um, so, I mean, part of my advantage, I would say, at the CEV is that I bring like kind of a, a North American perspective to to the European market, I guess, which I think I think has helped out a lot. But I would say for the VLA, I mean. There's so much you you have so much flexibility and freedom, right? Like, like there's a certain way the CV has to do their broadcast. There's certain ways we have to fulfill obligations to all our different stakeholders. But in I don't know everything about the VLA, but you know you could if you want to change the way you broadcast a game, try something out. You know, shoot from the baseline one game. You know, okay, this weekend we're gonna shoot. We have this new camera. We're gonna shoot in 120 frames per second, or we're gonna you know do do all this kind of cool stuff. You can go do it. I, I imagine. Yeah, like, I think true. there's a lot of way, I think there's a lot of ways you can play around with the, the broadcasting because I think there's so much potential in volleyball that's just unexplored. We've kind of shot volleyball in the same way, same angle, in the same you know the same cuts, everything since the '60s, '70s when we started having it on TV. Yeah, the the baseline one is a good point. That's by far my favorite angle to view volleyball from. When like people. Uh, I assume you know what data volley is. It's like at least the American system for keeping stats. When, when people do data volley, they, use it too, we use it too. Yeah, they insist on sitting on the baseline. Uh, I prefer to commentate from the baseline. Um, the, the event, I always watch from the baseline as well. Yeah, the event that we ran in July was all filmed from the baseline. I think it's a more fun way to watch the game. The only drawback is sometimes it's hard to see what's going on on the far side of the court um, if you just yeah. put the camera no, up. I think there's still, but that's what I mean, VLA. You can play around with it, okay? Yep. Like maybe be like, oh, like 38 degrees, like, is the best like angle to view volleyball. We don't know that, right? Because nobody's like actually thought Tried about it, it that much. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I would say, I would say, you know, I would try. I wouldn't try and be the same product as European volleyball, except um, North American. I would try just to be like, okay, this is the way we're gonna do volleyball, and it's gonna be different from how Europe and how Asia consumes volleyball. But we think this is the way forward. So yeah, that that's kind of an answer to my my next question that. I had before we get you out of here. It's a, yeah, if you could, if you could see the, what, what one thing do you personally want to see the VLA do this season? Because we do have a season. Uh, it's starting in January. Uh, we're going to have a show about that very, very soon to get all the details out there. Um, but there is more volleyball coming. So what's, what's something that you, other than, yeah, playing around with camera angles, which, which is a great idea, what's something you want to see us do? 50 frames per second, all your matches. Okay. That's simple. You know, also, <laughs> yeah, I, I think I think it would make it makes a big difference in terms of especially volleyball. I mean, you know, if I'm watching hockey, I'm I can't watch it in 25 frames per second. No, you can't. It's, it's impossible. It's like a slideshow, but we still have all our volleyball in, in 25 frames per second. So, being able to differentiate yourself that way, I think, would be a huge improvement right off the bat. Yeah, and, that's a yeah. big one that like nobody really gets until they see it or until they see like the two side by side. Yeah. Exactly. And you know, I, I'm not sure what what your stats keeping or the stats are planning on on being, but you know, I think detailed and advanced statistical measurements. At least, <laughs> maybe this is more of a me thing, but I think that's also something we're missing a bit in volleyball. I agree. I I would love 
yeah, having a data volley person like sit next to me as I commentate, feeding me stuff like to even yeah. say the matches and like to post graphics of after the fact is a huge deal. And that's something that we are working on, I promise. And I would say, uh, you know, the commentary, but you guys already have that covered. So yay, <laughs> good, good, good English commentary that actually t knows the backgrounds of the players and you know is able to break down and analyze the match, which I, yeah, it's good. It's good that you guys have that. Let's say. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I, I don't know where. If, if even I were if, if I were just a fan, not just a commentator, if I were watching, if there were either no commentary or bad commentary, it would they would lose me as a fan pretty quick. That is for sure. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I'll even watch. Uh, I watch games with Italian commentary or Polish commentary on. Me too. Yeah, because it's just nice to have. Like you just it feels like you you have like the excitement a little bit. Yeah, more, it's something especially without fans right now. Right. I'll, like the only thing I could pick out is players' names, but e excitement levels translate across all languages, and yeah. I do that when I commentate too. Like I don't. I assume that people at least know what's going on with volleyball, but even if they don't, uh, my excitement level about a play can tell people a lot, even if exactly. they don't understand and the it, words I'm saying. It's huge for the uh, post production content as well, like post match content, like the when you're clipping highlights and doing all that. Like I think people don't realize how big of a part commentary is of that as well couldn't agree more every great like highlight play you've ever seen across any sport has like an iconic commentary moment attached to exactly. it and if that is lame then the play just isn't as good as maybe the play actually is it makes a huge difference yeah all right dude that's a lot of stuff that's a lot of volleyball that we just talked about for the people uh i hope everyone enjoyed that i think you and i have a match to go watch right we're gonna go watch some italian league oh i mean saturday night we have games Friday, Saturday, Sunday right now with all the COVID mixed up stuff. So it's like, I mean, it's perfect because we're in lockdown right now. I can't go to like the bar or something on a Saturday night. <laughs> so, so might as well stay in and watch volleyball. What else Why is not? there to do but watch volley? Dan, thanks yeah. so much for joining me, man. Uh, this is a blast. I'm excited for your fans to listen to this show, for our fans to listen to your show. Uh, everybody, please go follow at 51VB on Instagram. Uh, listen to the podcast. It's YouTube too. You YouTube too. Your YouTube channel. Yeah. Uh, yeah, your YouTube not as, channel. It's not as alive right now as my other platforms, but I I'm, I'm, might have a video coming very soon. Go so. subscribe to it. Um, I'll put that in the description on our YouTube channel. I'll, I'll make sure I'll, everyone can find your stuff as easily as, the, as possible. Yeah. All right. Th thanks for having me, Rob. This is really fun. I always love talking volley. Of course. Love it, dude. I mean, that's what I do all the time every day, so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah hey a uh, couple couple north american volleyball media people under the age of 30 we're a we're a rare breed these days exactly I mean, me you and <laughs> that's... mostly that's pretty much it <laughs> your next guest as well that's right yeah i uh, look forward to that i'm actually recording with him later today so uh, a lot of don't spoil who it is yeah a lot of north of the border action uh coming on the deep corner here pretty soon thanks everyone for watching uh we'll see you next time very soon um Go follow Dan, go follow 5-1 and all their stuff. Uh, we will see you next time.